The observable universe is a big place that's been around for more than 13 billion years. Up to 2 trillion galaxies, made up of something like 20,000 billion billion stars, surround our home galaxy. In the Milky Way alone, scientists assume there are some 40 billion Earth-like planets in the habitable zone of their stars. When we look at these numbers, it's hard to imagine that there is nobody else out there. It would change our perception of ourselves forever if we found others. Just knowing that this vast place is not dead would shift our perspective outwards and could help us get over our irrelevant quarrels. But before looking for our new best friends or worst enemies, we have a problem to solve. What are we actually looking for? In a universe that big and old, we have to assume that civilizations start millions of years apart from each other and develop in different directions and speeds. So, not only are we looking over distances of dozens to hundreds of thousands of light years, we're looking for a civilization ranging from cavemen to super advanced. So, we need a conceptual framework to enable us to think better thoughts that make us able to search better. Are there universal rules that intelligent species follow? Currently, our civilization sample size is only one, so we may make incorrect assumptions based solely on ourselves. Still, better than nothing. We know that humans started out with nothing but minds and hands that could build tools. We know that humans are curious, competitive, greedy for resources, and expansionist. The more of these qualities our ancestors had, the more successful they were in the civilization building game. Being one with nature is nice, but it's not the path to irrigation systems or gunpowder or cities. So it's reasonable to assume that aliens able to take over their home planet also have these qualities. And if aliens have to follow the same laws of physics, then there is a measurable metric for progress, energy use. Human progress can be measured very precisely by how much energy we extracted from our environment and how we made it usable to do things. We started with muscles until we learned to control fire. Then we made machines that used kinetic energy from water and wind. As our machines got better and our knowledge of materials expanded, we began to harness the concentrated energy from dead plants we dug up from the ground. As our energy consumption grew exponentially, so did the abilities of our civilization. Between 1800 and 2015, population size had increased sevenfold while humanity was consuming 25 times more energy. It's likely that this process will continue into the far future. Based on these facts, scientist Nikolai Kardashev developed a method of categorizing civilizations from cave dwellers to gods ruling over galaxies. The Kardashev Scale, a method of ranking civilizations by their energy use. The scale has been refined and expanded on over the decades, but in general it puts civilizations into four different categories. A Type 1 civilization is able to use the available energy of their home planet. A Type 2 civilization is able to use the available energy of their star and planetary system. A Type 3 civilization is able to use the available energy of their galaxy. A Type 4 civilization is able to use the available energy of multiple galaxies. These levels differ by orders of magnitude. It's like comparing an ant colony to a human metropolitan area. To ants, we are so complex and powerful, we might as well be gods. So to make the scale more useful, we need subcategories. On the lower end of the spectrum, there are Type 0 to Type 1 civilizations. Anything from hunter-gatherers to something we could achieve in the next few hundred years. These might actually be abundant in the Milky Way. But a civilization that is not actively transmitting radio signals into space might be as close as our nearest stellar neighbor, the Alpha Centauri system, and we would have no way of realizing they exist. But even if they transmitted radio signals like we do, it might not be very helpful. On an interstellar scale, humanity is practically invisible. Our signals may extend over an impressive 200 light-years, but this is only a tiny fraction of the Milky Way. 
And even if someone were listening, after a few light years, our signals decay into noise, impossible to identify as the source of an intelligent species. Today, humanity ranks at about level 0.75. We have altered our planet. We've created huge structures, mined and stripped mountains, removed rainforests and drained swamps. We've created rivers and lakes and changed the composition and temperature of the atmosphere. If progress continues, and we don't make Earth uninhabitable, we will become a full Type 1 civilization in the next few hundred years. Any civilization that becomes a Type 1 is bound to look outside because it's likely that it's still curious, competitive, greedy and expansionist. The next reasonable step towards transitioning to Type 2 is trying to alter and mine other planets and bodies. This might start with outposts in space, transition to infrastructure and industries near the home planet, move on to colonies, and end with terraforming other planets by changing their atmosphere, their rotation. A group of researchers say they've identified at least seven stars that might be surrounded by super advanced alien megastructures known as Dyson spheres. Yes, I said alien structures and I know what you're thinking, but just stay with me here because the basic idea was this. Superior intelligent life might build big structures around their home stars or planets as a way to harness or reuse that energy. A 1960s physicist who came up with this idea, Freeman Dyson, argued that if these structures existed, there'd be so much energy that human scientists on Earth could probably spot it because it would emit a lot of infrared radiation. So in this new study, researchers say they found seven sources glowing in the infrared, those are their words, but couldn't find an obvious explanation for why these sources are glowing so much, which could mean they're Dyson spheres or something else entirely. And what I'm saying is, what? Space is so crazy. I wish I understood it better. So let's talk to a scientist to help wrap our heads around this. I'm joined now by Professor Jana Levin. She is an astrophysicist and author of the book, Black Hole Survival Guide, as well as the Claire Toe Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Bernard College of Columbia University. Professor, first of all, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. I tried to explain it a little bit. That was my nice. very dirty version. I was going to be like, yeah, but I'm an English major who just had Google. <laughs> You uh, have a PhD in physics from MIT. So how do you explain Dyson well, spheres? I think that was an excellent explanation. If you look at where we are relative to the sun, we're very far away. We're the third planet in. And imagine the light that we try to collect, let's say, with solar panels on people's homes or on any roofs to, to collect that energy. Imagine if you got really close and you caught everything the sun was emitting. It's just a tremendous amount of power. And so Freeman Dyson was thinking about this. Actually, he was originally inspired by sci-fi. Um, uh, written by Olaf Stapleton like decades earlier. And his idea wasn't so much a solid sphere. It was really like satellites in orbit, a network of things that would be orbiting and would essentially, what we would now say, have solar panels and are collecting that energy. So what do you make of this study, just <laughs> generally speaking, I guess? Do you think it's possible that these are the elusive Dyson spheres? So I think it's very unlikely, but I'm open. We have to be open as scientists. If we think we know the answer before we go and observe, then we're already defeated. Um, I think it's terribly unlikely, but it's extremely exciting and interesting to, to think about. And it's fun to think about. What's, what's probably going to happen is we're going to look at, at this infrared signature that you mentioned, and we're going to find out that there's a natural cause. Mm. Um, so a lot of things emit heat in the infrared. You know, infrared goggles allow us to see um, human bodies and the heat of human bodies. And it's not that dissimilar that when we look in the infrared, we see things emitting heat. So the idea was if we had this very technologically advanced civilization, like thousands of years beyond where we are right mm -hmm. now, and they could build such a thing and it was collecting all this energy, it would collect also some heat and it would have to cool off and we would see that in the infrared. But there are other natural possibilities that, are, that could explain What do you think those possibly could well, be? Well, it could be a very young star that still has some material around it in kind of a disk, and that's how planets form. Planets coalesce out of these early disks, and, and those can emit in the infrared. It could be that there's actually an entire galaxy in the distance behind the star, and we're seeing that galaxy, and we can't disambiguate those. Um, or it could be planetary collisions. I mean, there are natural explanations. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think it's worth noting, we're looking just a thousand light years around us. That sounds far, but it's actually really close. That's, that's our backyard. Mm -hmm. The entire Milky Way galaxy 
is 100,000 light years across. And there are probably more planets in the Milky Way galaxy than there are stars. So we're talking of hundreds of billions and maybe trillions of planets out there. And I think we're in an era where we think